Okay, so I began to research the local history of typography some years ago. Uh, and the goal was to identify the fonts in use at the time. I started by making an inventory of all type specimens uh, locally printed between 1764 and the arrival of the composing machines in 1897. Um, printing was not supported in the French colony New France um, here and started almost immediately under British rule. That's why we're beginning the study in 1764. In total, 12 type specimens have been located, five by Augustin Côté and Company, five by the Montreal Type Foundry, one by Lavol and Gibson, and one by the newspaper Le Courrier de Saint-Hyacinthe. So this is the type specimen. As you see, it's uh, bound inside um, a bound review. It's um, Le Ministrel. Uh, published in the same years. Uh, so it's somewhat hidden, and it's all, it led to a long search to relocate it this year. Uh, since the old Montreal Library was closed some years ago and the collections were moved, and this was still in a box somewhere, they had many copies of Le Ministrel, but only this one has this hidden inside. So as you see, it's only five printed pages. Um, in this specimen, so I translated it for you, uh, Cote proudly announces the acquisition of new characters, vignettes, ornaments, and an Albion press. He also specifies that everything comes without exception from Paris and London, and all the equipment is from Europe. So who was this man? Um, one of the only two printers of the province to have published type specimens. So Coté was uh, a French-Canadian, a Canadien, uh, born in Quebec City in 1818. He studied printing as a boy. At 16, he worked for a few years with John Lovell, who was to become one of the most important printers of the time uh, in Montreal, until the rebellion of 1838-39. Um, after that, he was a few months assistant director at the Quebec Gazette. Uh, that was at the time a bilingual newspaper, and as soon as it stopped to be bilingual, Cote left, bought a press, and he started his own print shop, and together with associates, he launched a new, the newspaper, Le Journal de Québec, so this is the first issue. Uh, and here you have a comparison two years later. So, I was intrigued with this little 1844 specimen, one of the first two printed in this province. So if you paid attention earlier, there was another one in the same year. Do you remember? No? The Montreal Type Foundry. It's um, preserved in Toronto. That one, very difficult to access. So without expecting much of it, I took pictures and close-ups. I had an analog camera with a fantastic macro lens at the time. And with close-ups, I found something. Um, so examining the prints, I made a surprising discovery. The accented letters did not match the font. Aha. Uh -huh. um, so, um, in addition, I wasn't too impressed with the design of the diacritics. Why did Cote, a French-speaking printer who purchased all of his characters from London and Paris, resort to this solution? So, our immediate first impression both Will and I, was that the font might be of Scott's origin. If so, which foundry provided it? And how could the peculiarly accented letters have been made? First impressions suggested the work of the foundries of Miller and Company in Edinburgh and Alexander Wilson and Sons in Glasgow in the early 19th century. I remembered James Mosley's definitive account of these types and the complex relationship that they have to the later 20th century types produced under the name Scotch Roman. And I recalled also that it had been through American foundries that this term Scotch Roman came into use. The Scots foundries didn't call it Scotch Roman. But I also knew that the Scotch foundries had a well-established export trade. A little later than this, in the Montreal type foundry specimen of 1850, the owner, Charles Polsgrave, writes, I have ordered from Scotland additional faces to my book letter. So, if there was a foundry in Montreal, 
Wouldn't Cote have got his additional accented sorts from there? Well, I thought about it, but it seems that the Montreal Type Foundry closed during the rebellion and wasn't backed into operation when Cote ordered his fonts. So I did verify that. And uh, it's not listed in the businesses, but only in the alphabetical directory. And we really have no proof that uh, any um, commerce was done by the Montreal Type Foundry in those years. So we'll need to look elsewhere. Comparisons with both Miller and Wilson types from specimens held at the St. Bride's Printing Library and elsewhere showed some limited similarities, but no match. The nature of the partial matches was interesting. Comparison of some letters, notably the lowercase g, showed both significant similarities and differences. Other letters varied more substantially across the fonts as a whole. The Wilson types from the 1823 and 1826 specimen had tended to differ from the Cote specimen in much more general characteristics, notably taller ascenders and deeper descenders. The nature of the similarities strongly suggests that the relationship of Cote's types to Miller's could be sequential, that it's not a similar type of the same period, but a later derivative of the original model in which some letters have been left intact and others revised. But why hadn't he imported his types from France in the first place? Well, Will, uh, the best explanation that I have so far is that a British, as a British colony in which the English language was meant to be dominant, Canada would import essentially, essentially from England and the other colonies. I see. <laughs> Yeah, it continues. <laughs> <laughs> Mosley identifies the first use of the term Scotch in the types of the Dickinson Foundry in Boston, cut specially for them by Wilson in 1839. So this looked to be a promising lead as a possible supplier for Cote, though Mosley goes on to say they do not, in fact, look much like the Miller and Wilson types. Dickinson's was a recently established foundry in a reasonably accessible location with superior new types. It would obviously have been more feasible and economical to import from the USA than from England or Scotland or Ireland. So I located a slightly later specimen in the Carey Library at RIT. But on inspection, the types seem indeed quite different in style and not even very close to 20th century monotype Scotch-Roman, they seem considerably more modern, engineered, and rational when compared to the Miller and Wilson faces from the 1820s. They are, if you like, a Scotch-modern rather than an early 19th century Scots face. So the provenance of Cote's types remains open. We're still looking for suggestions. We're still following leads. I still think that despite his claims for an exclusively European source, there's a strong possibility that he used a foundry from the United States using admittedly types derived either directly or indirectly from Miller's or Wilson's example. It's interesting to note that there were several Scots type founders already established in the USA by this time. It's interesting because I disagree with this theory. <laughs> I'm, I'm quite convinced that it is of uh, Scott's origin uh, and other authors too, so we will still inquire. But one of the main questions that concerns us is how might these alternate sorts have been made? The letters that clearly don't match the rest of the font, but that have the diacritics that, um, that, we're, that distinguish this specimen. We discounted the idea of Cote importing punches or matrices from France. This would have been subject to many of the same constraints as buying in new sorts while adding the further demands of casting from them. So we narrowed the remaining possibilities down to three options. The first is that Cote commissioned a local skilled tradesman to cut additional punches. This seems feasible enough. Fred Smyers has established that the skills required to cut a punch are actually quite transferable ones. Anyone skilled in small-scale metalwork could, 
with appropriate instructions, be commissioned to cut a punch. Producing an appropriate mold might have been more challenging, but we can assume that Coté would have had access to the Diderot d'Alembin Encyclopédie, which gives a good visual description of the processes and equipment used in typefounding. To support this hypothesis, we needed to determine whether Coté's circle of acquaintances might have included people with the necessary skills, watchmakers, locksmiths, other metal trades. And indeed, there were many. So I found listed in the Marcotte directory of 1844-45 of Quebec City, plenty of founders, copper, lead, iron, brass, watchmakers, and jewelers. And as you see, only one mid midwife. I couldn't believe it. Um, and John Downer, if he's here. I think I saw two of them. <laughs> Nigel Roche at the St. Bride's Printing Library made a suggestion I wouldn't otherwise have considered. Electrotyping had been invented just six years earlier, and some of the first instances of its use in printing occur in the United States, as in this 1841 illustration by Joseph Alexander Adams, which compares direct printing from a wood carving with printing from a copper electrotype copy. An electrotyped punch for each of the diacritic letters could have been made from any suitable piece of printed French type. I was very excited to find Updike's quote from Benjamin Franklin when he was manager of Samuel Keimer's press in Philadelphia earlier in the 1720s. Franklin writes that our printing house often wanted sorts and there was no letter founder in America. I had seen types cast at James's in London, but without much attention to the matter. However, I now contrived a mold, made use of the letters we had as punch-ons, struck the matrices in lead, and thus supplied, in a pretty tolerable way, all deficiencies. Using type metal as a punch and lead for your matrix would have been pretty basic, to say the least. But if they were addressing the problem in this way in the USA about 100 years earlier than our case, we might assume that this method became an established solution or fallback. But looking at the Cote specimen, using the original type as a punch wouldn't account for the discrepancies of form that we see, suggesting that they would have had to use sorts from a different typeface to make these improvised punches. Well, it's simple, Will. Cody purchased separately um, these peculiar accented swords. So we have three different hypotheses. The idea that Cote commissioned a local skilled tradesman to cut some additional punches, that he made use of the very new technology of electrotyping, or that he adopted the rudimentary but if we're to believe Franklin, serviceable method of actually using sorts to create new, as punches to create new strikes and matrices. A set of questions follows on from this concerning the punch production method for the diacritics themselves. Were these diacritics supplementary punches to be aligned with the letter punch before striking or aligned with the letter impression in the strike? Or were letter and diacritic produced as one punch? Considering these questions would help us to determine which method was the most likely. If the punches were specially cut locally, either approach would be feasible but the practical advantages of a dual punch approach would be quite limited. Comparisons between the accented Cote letters confirmed that the letter remained broadly consistent under several different diacritics. This would argue for a set of supplementary punches being added to one single form of letter. And this might support the idea of the Franklin method, allowing the letter to be struck from a non-accented sort and a diacritic added with a separate punch, either by using a compatible existing sort, such as a prime. And we were struck by the form of the acute and the grave here, um, and particularly how widely modeled they are. 
it seems plausible that a prime could have actually been pressed into service as a punch to make these shapes. But again, the question, why using a different E for this of a different design? Why not strike from the correct E and O and U of your, of your font? But I think that Natalie's hypothesis answers that. If electrotyping had been used, it would have been logical for Cote to work from the best French printed examples that he could access. This would account for a difference in the form of the letters, but wouldn't account for the rather inconsistent and variable quality of the diacritics. While the grave and the acute are quite stylishly formed, the circumflex seems considerably more crude. And this argues against the idea of electrotyping from French text and supports instead the idea that an existing sort, such as a prime, might have been used to form the grave and acute, while the circumflex had to be originated specially. So a mixture of our first and third hypothesis. As you see, the more we progress, the more new questions are raised. Our future research plans include uh, studies and comparisons of diacritics, comparing other local type specimens and prints, gaining a better understanding of trades and taxes in 1840 to be sure that it wasn't possible to buy from France the text type, surveying uh, type foundries uh, in the United States and Britain in the 1840s. And testing the electrotyping method. In conclusion, despite the peculiar accented letters used, one must say that to the naked eye, Cote had a, well, let's show you again Cote maybe. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> Cote had found a satisfactory solution to setting type in French at a time when Lower Canada had just been subjected to a union meant to suppress the French language throughout the country. Merci. Thank you.